Back on FT Live on Stadium, Braun Kratz, Pierzynski, and Kelly Krull joining us right now. You can follow her at Kelly underscore Krull and does a great job reporting on the Atlanta Braves for Valley Sports South. Also, just one of the best in the biz, both on camera and whenever you're covering the team. Like, doesn't just do this to, to one person. Anyone that's in town, Kelly, I'm going to brag about you for a sec. Helps you with information. Like, hey, I've been watching this team whole, all year. Because I asked someone once because she's always been helpful with me when I'm in town. Like, hey, this is what's going on with the team. Does that to everyone. So just all around team player in the biz. Appreciate you. How you doing, Kelly? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited for the last six games here. And then uh, what we grind through the entire season for the, the month of October. So I'm really looking forward to it, especially with this Braves team and uh, seeing what they can do after such a spectacular regular season. So we got into the pitching yesterday. So can you combine the thoughts in the last week on Freed and Morton with the injuries on the IL with how you think they combat that, especially in round one? Let's say even if if Freed isn't himself, right? Can't give them the amount of innings that he would want to. We were debating too, like, is this a, an elite bullpen in your mind where they can kind of bullpen their way through a game or two if need be? Yeah, so I think... To start with Max Freed, if this tonight were a playoff game, Max would be pitching, and I don't think it would even be an issue. I, he would pitch through it, I think. Um, he is not a concern, really, for them. They are just being extra cautious with the ability here to have the two weeks that they have to really, really get rid of that blister as much as um, it was aggravating him. But I don't think they're worried about him or concerned about him at all. And then you guys talk about the schedule of the NLDS this year for the National League. They get those extra days. And so you can still go Freed and Strider, and they're more than likely going to turn to Bryce Elder, see what they can get from him. Like you just mentioned, Scott, they got guys in the bullpen who are very good, who could cover multiple innings. That's where Kyle Wright is going to be, I think, to start the postseason. And if they need Need three innings out of him, four innings out of him. I think, I think they could get that. I think they could get that from a couple of guys. Jesse Chavez can do that for them. Michael Tonkin can do that for them. Um, and then there, while it will be a Glacius closing, it will be AJ Minter setting him up. There are other guys, plenty of them back there that have done that. So to your point, I think this bullpen, when it comes down to these games that matter so much, um, they will be dominant like they were in the first half. Charlie Morton is the one that you miss, right? I mean, the sprained right index finger. He gets three weeks. He's going to miss the DS. Can you have him ready? Um, can he be sharp? I mean, he is Charlie Morton after all. Nobody on this Braves team has pitched in as many postseason games as he has. Um, you're going to take that experience any day if he can get healthy. I just, um, it's disappointing. It's disappointing for Charlie. Um, I know AJ, you probably know him really well over his years in the league. Um, he's just one of these guys that you'd like to see go out if this is indeed going to be it for him. With the opportunity to post in or to pitch in the postseason. So I think that's just probably right now their biggest concern is is how ready can he be if they give him an entire full week three weeks. And of course they have to get there, guys. So <laughs> they need to make it to the NLCS for Charlie to be in play. But um I certainly hope that's possible for him and his career. Is the team nervous about what happened last year in the playoffs? Has there been talk of that? I mean they're they're out here strutting their stuff in the regular season, but if you won 100 games last year, you were out before the NLCS. And is there t ever talk, like real talk? Because Scott was saying that you have a lot of real talk. Like, did they ever say, oh, no, we're, we're losing some guys right here. They might not be 100% right before the playoffs start. I, I see what you mean. And certainly, I think, if anything, last season and the way it ended has got to be motivation for this club. Um, and as far as they're down a guy or, oh, Charlie's not going to be around, I mean, this is a team that won 100 games for the majority of the season without two of their horses. Like, they didn't have Max Freed and Kyle Wright for most of the season, and they were able to still end up winning 100 games, like you just mentioned. So I think they have a lot of confidence in what this offense can sort of carry if indeed they're not getting what maybe they would hope to from some of their starters. And uh, that's a really good problem to have when you can turn around and say, hey, Ronald, hey, Austin, hey, Matt, hey, guys, let's let's pick up this pitching staff if we need to um, throughout the – well, throughout at least the first round. But I, I still – I anticipate – I mean, 
it's not too shabby to have Max Fried, Spencer Strider, and a guy who was an all-star this year pitching in games one, two, and three <laughs> of the DS. Yeah, not too shabby also with the league's best lineup. So I agree there. <laughs> then bullpen specifically late in games. What does the circle of trust look like right now? We know that always changes come playoff time. So like who are the, say, three or four that are circled? And maybe if there's someone on the fence, depending on how they look in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have your Iglesias closing. You're going to have A.J. Minner setting up. I think they've been incredibly impressed with Pierce Johnson since picking him up at the at the trade deadline. I think he's going to be really big for them down the stretch. Um, their other lefty they're going to go to, they're going to keep Brad Hand for sure on that postseason roster. Um, and then you've got the guys probably that you're going to be looking at in case you need length like your Kyle Wright like your Michael Tonkin. And the one that I think they're going to want to know, I mean, Jesse Chavez, you guys, has just come back from missing a significant time with that fracture in his leg. And um, he's looked dynamite. And of course, the two uh, instances, appearances that they've needed him. But, um, you know, I think you still have to kind of wonder exactly where he is as far as how sharp can he be um, physically, like if they needed him multiple days, multiple games. I, I, so I think that's going to be something they're going to really need to be uh, probably just the transparency between Jesse and the team is going to need to be there for that. Um, but I think they feel really good about m the majority of the guys they have um, right now and the ones that they've used here in the last month or so. Who makes this team tick? Not who gets the not who gets the offense going, not who comes out and throws seven shutout innings. Who makes this team tick? I hate when guys always say, well, who's the leader? We have a lot of leaders. Who's the guy that makes this team tick? It's a great question because there are a lot of leaders on this team. Anytime you've got a team full of all-stars, they all lead in their own way and by their own example. But I, I'm going to say Ozzy Albies, their second baseman, is the guy that makes them all tick because I think he has just this um, joyful presence and also is able to kind of push guys uh, a little bit past maybe their comfort zone at times. Um, he's just, he's just um, Scott, you've been around him. Um, he's got so much energy and his ability to, as you guys know, with any clubhouse, galvanize the Latins, the Americans, the ability to speak. I think he speaks like five different languages certainly helps. And he's just in the ear of every single guy. And sometimes I think um, when it comes to second baseman, Ozzy Albies is overlooked for the um, production that he creates on a night in a night in basis. And it is definitely felt, I think when you feel those guys that make you tick more than anything is when they're gone. And Ozzy was gone for about a two-week stretch. He was dealing with an injury. And that's even when I could, could could feel that, you know, his presence was needed back in that dugout, back in that clubhouse. Just, uh, it, again, I'll go back to the energy. It's infectious. It's contagious. And it's certainly felt throughout this clubhouse. So he he's the guy I consider the one that kind of makes this clubhouse tick. Yeah. And in the playoffs, I mean, he is a guy that can take it to another level, too. He's played a lot of playoff baseball in his young career. Are him and Acuna still BFFs, like, just as much as they were several years ago? Or, you know, like, Acuna's got a fam now and all of that. I just yeah. remember when those two first came up in the league, like, inseparable, every meal together, the whole thing. Are you still seeing that, especially on the road from them? Yeah, to a degree, but like you just said, I mean, you know, their lives start to transition a bit. Acuna's gotten married. He's got a family now, like you mentioned, two young boys. He's and then Ozzy got married, and uh, same deal. I, I, they are still thickest thieves. But the one I see Ozzy really connecting with this year is actually actually Orlando Arcia, right? Because there was that transition with Dansby Swanson, who they're going to see here tonight with the Cubs coming back to town, um, but. He and Orlando Arcia have become very tight. The pregame workout that they go through with Ron Washington, they do that together, and they are just constantly picking on one another and picking on Wash, and it is just – one of the most entertaining things to watch from a daily basis. But I think that's a big reason though Orlando Arcia has been so seamless as being the everyday shortstop, tr though truthfully, to have Ozzy out there kind of encouraging in him, walking him through certain things. They, you know, get out there turning the double play together and, and working through that. I just, I think he's another reason that Orlando has been uh, such a big part of this team and, and what he has done this year with, an, you know, an all-star season as well. Kelly, Acuna's having a historic year, probably going to get to 40-70 unless something crazy happens. 
He's going to be the National League MVP. But how much has Mookie Betts having the year he's had? And even Matt Olson and Freddie Freeman. I know Olson doesn't get listed as much yeah. in that MVP conversation. He probably should get more attention. But has that fueled Ronald Acuna Jr. to be even better? Because every time he looks up, I mean, when they were in L.A., it was Acuna goes deep, Mookie goes deep. Yeah. Acuna does this, Mookie does this. I mean, it has to fuel him a little bit, right, to continue to go? Yeah, I think – and you know this. Anytime you've got those caliber of players – on the field together in what is a big series. I think they do like innately push one another, like I'll up, up show you, or I've got this, or can you match that? And so it was fun. That, that series with the Dodgers was a lot of fun. You had four potential at the time. Yeah. NL MVP candidates on the field at once. I don't think Matt Olson and or Freddie Freeman necessarily are getting the, um, as much hype and talk this year as probably they deserve just because of the seasons Ronald Acuna and like you mentioned Mookie Betts are having but I just when people ask me about it and I know I'm going to sound biased because I'm the one who's covering Ronald Acuna Jr. every single night versus seeing what Mookie Betts is doing but beyond the stats that you can sit there and look at numbers side by side and here's what this guy's doing here's what that's doing I think any of you who have seen Ronald in person like you understand like when that ball comes off his bat, it, he is one of those guys. It does. It sounds different. And he's also a guy that when I think of the definition of most valuable player and I think of who's the most valuable to their team, what Ronald does for the Braves lineup and the danger he is right off of the bat at the very start of every game and whether or not it's him going deep, which he's done, I'm pretty sure, 30 times or so this season there in that first A.B., he – uh He's on base, and that changes the entire complexion of an opening inning, which the Braves have scored more runs in the opening frame than any other team in the league. What he means and the tone he sets for this team when we're talking about an MVP is exactly what that award's about. I mean, it, it's tough to replicate, and it is tough to be the pitcher on the mound when Ronald's on base and he's looking for, yeah, 69 and 70 this season, which has just been unbelievable to watch you guys. Obviously, they're locking up all, you know, home field advantage throughout the playoffs, all that stuff. So the games don't really matter that much right now, except for that. But Ronald's got a little bit of <laughs> Estuary Ruiz is only three stolen bases behind him. Are they going to let Ronald play if it is a close race? Does that race matter? Because the question is, what if he slides in and gets hurt on a play on the last game of the year because he wanted – one more stolen base to get the stolen brace crown for this year. Yeah, that's that's an interesting – I mean, I really hadn't thought if it came down to, like, the last game or two. I mean, I honestly can think Ronald's going to get two stolen bases in the next – I mean, it could be tonight. could be tomorrow. Um, but I think with the Cubs in town playing with the, what they're playing for here tonight and the steal on the mound – I think you're going to see the lineup that you're going to see in the playoffs. And I think you're going to see Snip managing like this were a playoff game here tonight. So I think truthfully the next three three games or so, if not the next six games, I mean, you guys have seen every guy in this starting lineup for the Braves has played nearly every single game this season. This is a lineup that that is used to going out there and posting up every day, and they want to be out there. So I know – that sure, there could be this, well, what if health concern? And that's been the biggest storyline for Ronald when you ask him, how has this season been possible? And what's allowed you to be able to be putting up these kinds of numbers? He'll tell you it's because I'm fully healthy. I'm finally healthy. And I just I feel good for the first time throughout this entire season than I have in a long time. Um, so that is what he'll, he'll credit the year to. So that's a good point. I, I don't see... Snit really changing. If Ronald wants to be in there, he'll be in there. Um, I, I don't think that changes, especially with the time they're going to have off once they get through these next six games. I think they're more worried about keeping guys sharp than they are worried about their health and how they're feeling at this point in the season. So, Kelly, a little different thing here to, to ask yeah. you. Uh, Dansby Swanson went from Atlanta to Chicago. You went from Chicago to Atlanta. He recently said Cubs are a big deal and the Braves are a deal in Atlanta. So your thoughts on this? I think if Dan Zee could walk that statement back a little bit, he probably <laughs> would. <laughs> I mean, it's it's hard to, you, you know, AJ, because I was there when they hadn't won in 106 years. And that 
uh, World Series championship parade, the entire city and what it meant was on another level. But that's not to say that what the Braves have done here and their fan base, I mean, it's equally as fun in these playoff games. I mean, this is an incredible sports city. So is Chicago. Um, I think if you've ever basically gotten to live and or cover sports in either city, you've been very blessed is how I'll put it. That's how I'll leave it. Okay, perfect. Because I've done both and just on the other side of town. Yeah, on the good, you, you on the good side of town. Answer. On the good side of town. I was on the good side of town. You're on the bad side. But yeah. I mean, plus Wrigleyville and the battery are very similar. You know, a bunch of nice Stanley bunch of beers, you know, a bunch of bars and restaurants around. But here's the thing. When you, the teams go to playoffs, people don't know this. You, The local announcers, you guys kind of go away, right? So you're there for 162 games, and then mm. you, we don't see you. And I'm sure you guys are doing a pre and post, right, every game. So what do you do? Do you still go to road games? Do you still d- jump on the team charter and go to Philly if they play Philly in the first – it got to drive you crazy because when I do national games, we come in and we're like, okay, guys, you, you're done now for the year. You had a nice run. Congratulations. <laughs> the big guys are taking over now, right? But for you guys, it sucks because you guys worked this team the whole year. And then all of a sudden it's like, all right, the most important time of the year, you guys are gone. And I, I feel for you all. So what do you do? Do you still go? Yeah, it is kind of unfortunate. You heard Scott mention, I've always tried to be a good team player. So when Matt Weiner's coming in from TBS asking me for all the details on this team that he's going to take over, I'm giving him the best possible notes so that fans at home are um, able to really hear the stories within the stories that aren't just, you know, surface level. Hey, here's what Ronald Acuna has been doing all season long. Like at this point, I hope most baseball fans are aware of that. And I hope that, you know, they're able to hear, um, more about the team and a little bit further into another layer than just that that top layer. But you're right. Um, for a while, at least, I mean, gosh, this has been at least 10 years. Most of the regional networks will still carry that post game show. And so I do still go to the field when they're there. I go through workouts. I'm still uh, collecting interviews and all of that so that I get to go on the field if the team wins and I would still be getting to do a post-game interview with them, and that is what they would roll into the post-game shows. Now, I, I think the landscape might be changing a little bit this year, just given the state of what some of the regional networks is going through, and that's a, a real shame because you know this as well as anyone, AJ. It's the audience at home that um, ends up you know, um, losing in this situation if they're not going to carry some of the more uh, local uh, – productions and whatnot, but I, uh, I'm still around quite a bit because, Hey, the NBA season doesn't start for another month, you guys. So I will be attached to this team and doing what I can to still cover them and provide, um, I don't know the behind the scenes stuff. I'll tell you what people have really loved this year, probably more than anything is when I'm in that dugout and these guys go deep score, whatever. It's those shots in the dugout of the guys celebrating that I think people get a kick out of because they feel like they're there. They feel like they're in that dugout getting to watch how guys have all their special handshakes with one another. And they, they're always coming up with something new as far as celebrations. And and I think the audience just really gets a kick out of that. Kelly, tell Gretchen to give up her salary and then they'll, they'll be able to give you guys a post game. Okay. And then less of Frenchie is always more for everybody. Less Frenchie <laughs> equals more for everyone. So Fair. you should be good. Fair. Taking notes and passing both of those along. I'm sure that would work really well. Wait, just to bring the inside joke out, who's Gretchen, AJ? You Gretchen is the that. producer for Bally Braves. Oh, okay. Gretchen Kenny, she's been there, I don't know how long, but she's the producer. And then Frenchie is Jeff Frank or they're, they're sometimes everyday analysts, but he takes more days off than t- anyone yeah. I know. So it's weird. Yeah. It's Tom Glavin tonight. So, but Scott, you know, I mean, Gretchen's our backbone. She's yep. she's the reason we. But yeah, I, I'm sure she'll love to hear me say, "Give up half your paycheck." <laughs> <laughs> Just show her the clip of AJ. And she'll yeah. be like, oh, classic. <laughs> yeah, hey, real real quick though, like we're gonna be doing watch alongs, so it'd be great if you would join us for the watch alongs. Somebody that knows the inside beat of the to. of the Braves. I would love saying. to. Yeah, I mean, I could have a lot of time on my hands here in about a week, so <laughs> I would love, love to. That. Let's go. Love there it is. Love the uh, on on air ask. Yep. So can't, can't turn can't on put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Enjoy the last week. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Love being on with you. Take care. Thank you. You too. That's Kelly Crawl. You can follow her at Kelly 